This is going to be, we're going to continue in our series, Tripping Hazards. This is our third installment of this uh, series. You know, we've been talking about things that can trip you up in your spiritual walk with God. Things that, that you understand that in life, sometimes things just kind of get in the way and you just trip over them. You don't even know how that happened. And sometimes it's a little stumble. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but maybe you've fallen flat on your face and had to be picked up again. But there's these tripping hazards that try to knock you off, to trip you up from living the best life that you can for Jesus Christ. And so that's what we've been talking about. Week one, we talked about the tripping hazard of comparison. We learned that comparison is the thief of joy and that comparison will, neither, will either make you feel superior or inferior and neither of them honors God. Last week, we talked about distractions and how the devil wants to distract us from our relationship with God because he knows that distractions can cause us to drift. Now this week, we're going to dive into another tripping hazard, and it's this. It's the lack of wisdom. The lack of wisdom can be a tripping hazard in our life. You know, um, we're, we're going to be reading Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And so as you, you turn there, you flip there, or you click there, if you've got your favorite Bible app, of course, it'll be on the screens as well. I'm going to give you a little backstory as you look for Proverbs chapter 1, and we're, again, very beginning of that. Um, and let me give you just a little backstory. Uh, the writer of most of the book of Proverbs is Solomon. And he's considered uh, the wisest man to ever live. In the book of Proverbs, it, it really gives very practical suggestions for effective living. I mean, this book is not just the collections of saying, sayings. It contains deep spiritual insights drawn from experience. You know, a proverb is a short, wise, and easy to remember saying that calls people to action. You need to catch that. It's to call us to action because we're not just supposed to be hearers of the word. We're supposed to be doers of the word. So that's action. I mean, it doesn't argue about basic uh, spiritual or moral beliefs. It just states truth is what Proverbs does. Now, the book of Proverbs, it focuses on God, uh, his character his works and his blessings. It, it tells us and shows us, calls us to action to live a closer relationship with him. So in Proverbs chapter one, I want to read this to you starting in verse one. This is what the word of God says. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Now, you need to catch that. Because we can't, we can't walk through life and think we've got it all figured out. So no matter how long you've been living for God... And you've maybe read the Bible 14 times over and even more than that. And maybe you've got it memorized from the beginning to the end. It's more, there is more to life than what you know now. So we've got to continue to move forward. And that's what scripture is saying. Let the wise continue to be wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. Verse 6. By exploring the meaning of these proverbs and parables. The words of the wise and their riddles. Fear, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. See, we were never meant to stop growing in our wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. I mean, there are people that maybe have dogmatic opinions about everything and they're closed off to uh, anything new to them or, or they resent discipline and refuse to learn. You know, Solomon actually calls those people in verse 7 fools. Because if you think you know everything, you may not know anything. See, we have to be open to grow in our relationship with God, no matter where you feel like you are in your relationship with Christ. So in this room, there may be people, I mean, you've been living for God so long, you forgot when you gave your life to Him. You were one of those people that you were born underneath a pew in church. I mean, you've just always been going, and, and that's just you. You're not done to stop growing now. 
There's more and more to learn from the Lord and to grow in that wisdom because I'm telling you, a tripping hazard for someone that has been in church a long time is the, the thing of lack of wisdom because that means you stop growing. And we're not meant to do that. Now, if this whole church thing, this whole God thing is new to you, and maybe even this is the first time you've ever set foot in a church or th- you're becoming new to this, let me tell you this. Man, gaining knowledge and wisdom of the Lord, if there's anything I could tell you, that is what you need to be doing. You need to learn to fall in love with the Word of God, be able to gain it. Scripture says if we will hide it in our heart, we won't sin against Him. I mean, if we want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, man, we got to get into this book and we got to digest it, get it in our spirit, and we got to grow. We got to grow and we got to do, not just get it in our heads, but get it in our hearts and let it become actions in our life. You know, because knowledge is good. But let me tell you, I've read this, that, but there's a big difference between knowledge, which is having the facts, and having wisdom, which is applying those facts. Now let me go back to this right here. You could have this whole book of the Bible memorized, and you have knowledge. Man, someone can ask you a question and you can say, hey, go here, go here. And they can tell you whatever you want to know about this book. But unless you apply what you know, it's really not very useful to you. You're saying the word of God is not useful. I'm just telling you this. You can know everything from front to back. You can do it all. But unless you apply it to your life, this is really just another book unless you do something with this. You understand me? So, hey, that's what we've got to do. We've got to apply this. See, knowledge can be attained through education, while wisdom is mostly often acquired through experience. Now, the great thing is, is this. We can gain wisdom through other people's experience. As parents, as grandparents, you understand that. You, you know we, our kids or grandkids are going to make mistakes. We just hope they don't make the same ones we did. That's the goal. And so that's why we share life with them and say, hey, man, you probably don't want to do that. And sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But we try to make them better. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. Is that even in Proverbs, we understand we, this is written from experience. And we can learn from other people's experience. That is wisdom. And that's what the whole book of Proverbs is trying to do for us. See, because without wisdom, our knowledge is useless. We must learn to live out what we know. And if we never live out what we know, then we're never going to continue to grow. We're never continue to get better. We can have a not a lot, not a knowledge about God, knowledge about God. But if we never live it out, what good is it? We must never forget the purpose of having knowledge of the word of God. It is to equip us to do good. I mean, we shouldn't study God's Word simply to increase our knowledge or just to prepare us to win arguments. Our knowledge of the Word of God is not, is not, is not useful unless it strengthens our faith and leads us to do good, which is called wisdom. And we have to make sure we don't allow the tripping hazard of the lack of wisdom to slow us up. Miles Kingston said this, he said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Oh, hold on. Yeah, that was good. That one was funny. I was like, if you don't laugh at that, I I ain't got nothing else. So here's the, here's, this is, so you're saying, Jacob, so what is the step to, what do we have to do? It's pretty simple, this. If we want to not trip over the hazard of of not having wisdom, this is the answer to it. We have to gain wisdom. So how do we gain more wisdom of the word of God? How do we gain wisdom? How do we put all this into practice? It's this. James chapter 1 verse 5 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So if we want to combat, and if we don't want to fall on our face, we don't want to have a, a trip up of not being wise enough, not, not being able to put this stuff into practice, then we've got to ask God. And He's going to give it to us, because that's what Scripture says. So, let's dive into some more notes here. Because you were handed notes when you, were, you came in. So, to avoid the tripping hazard... Of the lack of wisdom, we must gain wisdom. And when we do gain wisdom, it's going to lead us to this. Number one, a life of discipline. 
Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3, going back to read this. It says, the purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. Now, what does a life of discipline look like? Now, actually, just a couple weeks ago, I just, I, or actually it was Sunday night, I talked to somebody in our church that's a runner. And uh, they run half marathons, and I asked, I asked the question, are you ever going to run a marathon? And they're like, hey, I've always wanted to, trying to figure that out. But it just takes a lot of training, because this is what I've learned about running a marathon. One, I don't ever want to do it. <laughs> Two, it's very hard work to prepare for it. See, running a marathon isn't something we just wake up and we go do. To build the endurance to finish a 26.2 mile race takes months of strict physical training. It's getting up early and morning runs, afternoon runs. Whether they feel like it or not, it takes commitment and discipline. While there, see, while there's physical benefits to this kind of training, of the strong legs, the healthy heart, I mean the abs that everybody wants, there's also the spiritual benefit of learning discipline as well. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul compares the drive that it takes us to finish, uh, finish uh, a Christian life well, to live a disciplined life. It, it, the drive, it's the same drive that it takes to run a race. See, there are going to be mornings that you don't feel like reading your Bible. There's going to be Sundays that you don't feel like coming to church. There are going to be days and people that you don't feel like forgiving. But like an athlete who pushes through to reach their goal, we must, have a, we must choose each day to push past our feelings and circumstances to keep following Jesus the very best that we can. Because if we truly want to not have the tripping hazard of the lack of wisdom, let me tell you, to live a life of wisdom, it takes a disciplined life. And there's going to be times that we just don't feel it. But I don't know if you've learned this yet. I'm sure most of you have. Man, we can't rely on our feelings. Our feelings will trick us. Our feelings will mess us up. Our feelings will take us off track. Our feelings because of we may just not get a good night's sleep, so we wake up not feeling it. Or you know what? We may have a disagreement, and so hey, I'm just not feeling it. We have to make sure that we don't, we have to stay disciplined, just like the runners that are preparing for a race. They don't skip days, they don't, they don't skip meals, they do the things right. They are intentional about what they do in discipline. That is what a disciplined spiritual life looks like. Even the days we don't feel like reading our Bible, guess what? We push through and we read our Bible. Those days that we don't feel like coming to church, we sure we, we set three alarms on. On those days to make sure we get up and we come to church. Why? Because we know it's going to be good for us. We get to be in the presence of God. We get to connect to God. We get to connect to others. And that's what it's about. See, the difference between physical training and spiritual training, it's the reward. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says this, For physical training is of some value. But godlessness has godless, godless value has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. See, the medal that we receive at the end of the race is a good thing, but it is not compared to the spiritual strength we receive when we truly live a life of discipline. See, striving toward physical goals are great goals to have, but striving toward a life of spiritual discipline has value that this life and, and, and that we can't even comprehend how much it's going to help us in this life and the next step of life, which is heaven. See, I read an article that LeBron James, basketball player, he spends $1.5 million each year on his health. That means on what he eats, a trainer, multiple trainers, that means physical therapy, that means probably a dietitian, 
Probably 1.5, I hope someone's cooking those meals for him. I mean, he spends the money to make sure that his body is in peak physical shape. Seeing as an elite, elite athlete, he has dis- disciplined himself day in and day out to help win the ultimate prize in his field, which is an NBA championship. But in the Bible, and this is not a secret, Paul knows exactly why LeBron spends more than a million dollars on his body. Paul got it before LeBron got it. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. It says, Do you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? That's a whole other sermon. I'm just going to let everybody chew on that for a minute. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. So they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Prize. Are you catching that? So I run with purpose in every step. That I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. What he is telling us there is he doesn't just, he understands to the training what it takes to be an athlete and the discipline that needs to happen. And see, that needs to be our same mindset that we can live a disciplined life so we don't trip up. Because if we say, hey, we want to have a life, we want to have a life full of wisdom then we have to live a life of discipline. And I'm trying to get you, trying to compare it to an athlete, how disciplined an athlete is. We need to be disciplined in our spiritual walk with God. And it goes beyond how we feel. So, living a life of discipline is wisdom. And see, when we gain wisdom, it will lead to a life of discipline. And number two, it is going to lead to a a life of success. Back to verse 3 of Proverbs 1, it says, The purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. See, people can define success in many different ways. I'm sure that across this room, even if you're watching online, you have your own definition of what a successful life looks like. You know, the definition of a successful life, it has been a challenge uh, that I've battled with over the years. Because when we look at successful lives, some people can say it's this, other people can say it's this, other people say it's this, other people say it's this, and we can keep going down the list. But because we are told that success in our world today is to define how much we accomplish How much money we make, our job title, how many friends we have on social media. We look at numbers, achievements, titles, and power. But let me say this. I want to say this before we get too far. It's okay to have aspirations. It's okay to have goals. It's okay to be successful in life and in your career, in your field, in what you're doing. You just need to make sure that we let those, those numbers not define our success in life when it comes to the things of God. So what exactly is God's definition of a successful life? Well, Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. Jesus lays this out to us in a parable of the three servants. So Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14, he says this. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work and gained another five bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went out, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, this parable is a picture for us of how God views our lives. God gives each of us, listen to me, each of us gifts, passions, assignments, resources, and relationships throughout our life to steward, to manage for His glory. I mean, in one day, we really are going to give an account to God. Each and every one of us will stand before God and give an account for what we have done with the life that He has given, that He's entrusted us with 
to manage, to steward on this earth. And that's what this parable, Matthew chapter 25, is about. God evaluates success by obedience and faithfulness to do what he's called us to do, not solely by results. So when we look at these men in this scripture, we see, okay, the man that had five, the man that had two, they went, they went out. They were given a certain amount of gold, and they went out, and it worked. They went out, and they made money with that money. But the one guy, he went and hid it, didn't do anything with it. See, each of these servants in this parable, as they were given their different amount of money to manage, the first two, they increased what they originally entrusted with. Yet, when the master returned, this is talking, representing Jesus, returned to receive the account from them, he praised both of them for their stewardship and rewarded each of them, even though it was in different quality, quantities. Now, the last servant wasn't praised or rewarded because he didn't do anything with what he was entrusted with. So what do we take out of this story? It's not about how much you achieve in the eyes of this world. Because, listen, because you could say, well, the guy that had five bags of gold, oh, he's awesome. He's the better leader. He's the most, he's most great. But the guy that just had two bags, he went out and he doubled and he was praised because he took care of what he was entrusted. Are you following me? It's not about how, how awesome you are, what gifts you have, what abilities you have. It doesn't matter how many, how many followers you have on social media. It doesn't matter about the numbers you have in your life. What it matters, are you doing the very best that you can do with what God has equipped you with and has given you? Because that looks different for every one of us. God has equipped, God has blessed, God has, done, God has given each and every person in this room special abilities, special gifts to do what only He has called you to do. And your responsibility is this. If you want to live in a successful life and consider that and have wisdom in that area, you need to make sure you do the very best that you can do with what God has given you to do. It's not about you comparing yourself to someone else. Well, look, at they're more gifted. They're more talented. Oh, look what they do. Look how they do it. It has nothing to do with what other, somebody else has. It has to do with your obedience and your faithfulness to God. That means with your abilities. That means with your gifts. That means with your time, with your talent, and with your treasures. What God has given you, you are to use to the best of your ability. See, it's not about how much we achieve in the eyes of the world. God's interest is that you are obedient and faithful to the things he had called you to do. See, my reward is not based on results. This is the awesome thing, though. Your reward is based on your obedience and faithfulness to what God has called you to do. Because there's some of you in this room that you're, you're, you're never going to be known across this world on social media. You may not even, people in this county or in this town may never know your name. But you have been faithful in what God has given you. And you have, some of you in this room, you have been called to be a mom. And your responsibility was to raise kids. And your name may never be in lights. It may never be on, be on a book cover. It may never flash across uh, the news. It may never do any of that. But you have been faithful in raising your kids to love Jesus and to love his church. That's a successful, successful life. And we could go around to each person's ability and giftedness and all of that. And whatever, you do, whatever God has equipped you to do, you do the very best of your ability. And you be obedient and you be faithful to Him. And that is a success, successful life. That is a life of discipline. That's a life of wisdom. That is a life that when you stand before God, you're going to be able to say, God, I gave my very best with what you gave me. Because God's not going to say, well, oh, hey, this person, look what all they did. No, he's going to look at you and say, hey, this is what I gave you. And you obeyed me and you were faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in and enjoy your reward. Because that's what ultimately we want to hear one day. See, 
We, have to, we can go after our, our goals, our aspirations in our life, and our careers, and our relationship. I know that I'm going to be. I'm going to do whatever, what God has equipped me. I'm going to be the very best I possibly can be what God has called me to do. And I would expect you to do the same. But just along the way, we got to ask God to help us keep the right perspective as we do so. Because sometimes it's not always about the numbers. It's about our obedience and about our faithfulness and what He's given us. So when we gain wisdom, it will lead us to a life of discipline, a life of success, and number three is a life that is right. Going back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. So what is right living? What does really living a right life look like? Well, it's living a life of righteousness. In the Greek, the word righteousness literally means up, uprightness, living right, integrity of one's lifestyle and character. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 says this, dear, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. So what does righteousness truly mean in just everyday language? It is us living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Not pleasing to man, not pleasing anybody else, but it is us living a right life that it pleases God in all the things that we do. All our decisions, all the words that come out of our mouth, all, all our actions, all that. It is right righteousness before the Lord. See, we don't try to live right to earn God's favor. We live out of the overflow of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives as we realize that Jesus died for us on the cross and we desire to live a life of obedience to His Lordship, that we are choosing to make right decisions that please God because of what He's done for us on the cross. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. See, those are the words of Jesus. And it's the central teaching uh, uh, in that moment in the ministry of Jesus that he laid out the foundation of life according to his kingdom. See, righteousness is a key command and desire of Jesus for his followers. A purity of life, integrity, correctness of thinking, feeling and acting are, are some of the definitions that the word righteousness is, is used for in Scripture. Those things right here of integrity, the purity of life, uh, having a life of virtue, that, that, that we allow the Holy Spirit to change the way we think because sometimes our thinking doesn't always line up with what God says in the Word of God. So, but guess what? Righteousness isn't this unattainable goal that you're thinking, well, Jacob, you're talking about perfection. I'm not mentioning perfection because perfection is something that none of us will ever meet on this earth. But what it is, it is this process that we are continuing in. And a great church word for that is sanctification. To live a righteous life, it is always improving in the Lord. And sanctification is simply that. It is us getting better one day at a time, moving forward and allowing the Holy Spirit to take things out of us that don't belong and to put things in us that do belong in our lives. And guess what? That sanctification is a never-ending process. Till the day you die, you are in the process of sanctification. You are in the process of getting closer and closer to the Lord. You're in this process of allowing the Lord to make you better, to make you more righteous, to make you more like Him. And it's a process. It is something, let me say, you will never end. If you think, well, I've made it. This is the, I, this is the good as you get. Man, I'm not going to change. I, I'm too old. I can't change. It's the way I've always been. I'm telling you, that's a tripping hazard. No matter how young you are, no matter your background, no matter what your family heritage is, no matter how old you are, we always need to be allowing the Lord to work in our lives so we can become more righteous and to become more like Him and stay in this process of sanctification. If you believe that, say amen. amen. See, it requires a commitment on our part to agree with Jesus and to pursue the lifestyle that he says is right. It is something you can absolutely live out 
in your life is the process of sanctification and to become righteous in His sight. Let me close with this. To avoid the tripping hazard of the lack of wisdom. Praise and worship team, you guys go ahead and come. To avoid the tripping hazard of the lack of wisdom, we must gain wisdom. And how do we gain that? We ask God because He will give it to us generously. Scripture tells us that. But when we gain wisdom, it's going to lead us to a life of discipline, a life of success, and a life that is right. I hope you're hearing me today. That I don't want you to be walking through life and think, well, this is as good as it's going to get, or I've arrived, or I've learned enough, or, hey, I'll never be able to learn that. You don't know my background. You don't know where I came from. Jacob, man, I'm too far gone. That, that's, not, that's not it. That's a tripping hazard. That's a lack of wisdom. That's a lack of wisdom. Wisdom is that you're choosing to follow Christ. And you're willing to go into this process of learning from Him, getting into God's Word. That you're saying, you know what, if I, I don't have wisdom, I'm asking God for it. And then, you know, as I gain wisdom, it's going to lead me into a life of discipline. It's going to be discipline. For you that are new to the faith, maybe new to, to, to following Jesus Christ, let me tell you, it takes discipline to follow Christ. It's not always easy. You don't always wake up going, oh, I love Jesus. Life is perfect. Life is great. It doesn't always feel that way. There's just some days that you read your Bible and you spend some time in prayer so you don't slap somebody. I mean, there's just some days that are that way. There's some days you come to church not because you feel it, not because you think you're going to get something great out of it, or, you, hey, you can't wait to do it. You come because you know that it's good for you, and you've got to start your week off right being in the presence of God. Just, there's some days it's just that way, and it's a life of discipline. And there's going to be some days you just don't feel like living for God. You think that happens? Yes. There's just going to be those days that you just are tough. That's where the discipline comes in. Saying, I'm not going to go on my feelings. I'm going to go on what's right. And then I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to make sure I'm connecting to God and I'm connecting to others. And then I'm going to love people along the way. Wisdom. Not just knowledge. Because I know a lot of people that know a lot of stuff. They don't get a lot of stuff done in life. If we want to make a difference for the kingdom of God, we got to have the knowledge and the wisdom go together. And I'm telling you, we all need more wisdom. Every one of us. Every one of us. No matter where you are at in your spiritual walk with God. Again, if you've been walking with Him longer than you can remember, or if this is a new journey for you, or maybe you've not even started that journey, to, but maybe today could be your day. It's a process. And you need wisdom. Godly wisdom. Would you stand with me across this place? What a great message from Pastor Jacob. We pray that the Lord spoke to you through it. Now, we would love for you to connect with us through Facebook and Instagram at Cobble First Assembly. And if you'd like to give, we have three ways to do that, in person, online, or through text to give. Those will be linked in the description box below. Thank you for joining CFA Online this week, and we hope to see you again next time.